Hey guys. So I'm watching the show on uh, Netflix uh, called Immigration Nation. And it just came out. This is August 2020. And it's, it's very well done. It got me thinking uh, about quite a few things and especially why there's no, there's still little context in American politics. And, you know, being in America in, in the year 2020, where we've had about 20 years of mismanagement uh, by almost all sectors within the government, uh, especially the lawyers and the judges who have genuflected before the law enforcement community, it shouldn't be a surprise that the law enforcement community has become less accountable over time. So let's talk about all this, especially context, because as I was watching this show, it, it's no one really looks good in the show. The parents don't look good when they're, when they're bringing, bringing the children across the border, knowing about the potential for uh, temporary or indefinite separation. The police officers don't look good because in many cases they're making numbers in order to justify their funding. One fact that stood out was that Don, under President Donald Trump's administration, uh, he hired over 100,000 additional Im immigration officers uh, for the federal government. So. You can see right away when you hire that many people, uh, you can see that the training is not necessarily going to be, uh, well, you can see that even if the training was done well, when you have to hire that many people right away, uh, you can see that there's going to be a lot of instances where discretion is, in, is, in, is used to produce different results. And we see that later on when we see somebody who, is a, um, who served in the, in the US military as, as a Marine, we see that when he says that, and I was pulled over, I was deported, uh, because if you are illegally in the U.S., yeah, if you're, to, you're stopped while driving a car, in many cases, you're not allowed to have a driver's license. And so that infraction leads to deportation because you're not in the system. Um, and in many cases, you're actually transferred through a joint program, federal state program, federal county program, you're actually transferred into the federal government's uh, web, which then leads to deportation uh, because the way that immigration violations are handled um, is through the enforcement body of the United States Department of Justice, which does not necessarily allow the kind of due process that people expect from the United States, no, from the, from the United States legal system. Uh, and in fact, they did a great job because they interviewed a uh, immigration judge and she flat out said that you know, during this administration, this, this Trump administration, uh, I was in a position where I had to make, deport a certain number of people. And when I would go to work, there would be this sort of chart that would tell me whether or not I was in the red zone. In other words, that I wasn't making my numbers and had to increase deportations. And so all this got me thinking because with, with respect to the Marine, he mentioned that when he was pulled over twice, the people that uh, pulled him over had also served in the US military and they refused to enforce the law, uh, which would have required them to arrest him and turn him, turn him over to ICE. And, and those were probably, I believe they were police officers, a uh, city or, or a county, in this case, probably a city. And so you can see right away that you've got discretion and you can also see that in the U.S., the discretion that is available to the executive branch is vast. Now, what that does over time, and this is a problem for any big country. When I say big, that means population. It also means landmass. The reason that we're in a position today um, where we don't have context, where none of the media mainstream media channels or even the ones that are on the outskirts none of them have context because I realized as I was watching this that the reason there's no context is because once you have an infrastructure in place any solution any problem is dealt with by adding a layer on top of that existing infrastructure rather than reforming the entire unit and part of that is again just because size when you have a massive agency with you know, like ICE, for example, um, that then this gets layered on to a joint venture with city and county police. You know, you have to make, you have to give, the, first of all, you have to have discretion, but also because you're working with these 
different levels of government, in most cases, three different levels, federal, state, and local, you have to have more discretion than you might otherwise want. So that leads to unequal results. Those unequal results then lead to other laws or reforms being passed that don't result in comprehensive reform, but essentially apply band-aids to the existing problem. And that's done because once again, you have these different layers of government. You also have the size issue. And you also have this idea that this old saying that laws without morals are useless. This goes back hundreds of, <laughs> over, over 200 years. And we can see why, because when you have a large landmass or a large population, you have security within that population. The lawyers are for the most part passing increasingly complex mechanisms, you know, to creating complex mechanisms that don't necessarily work. They have to go back and add on another layer. And this eventually gets splintered to the point where you don't, the left side of the body doesn't know what the right side of the body is doing. You can see this where, <laughs> this is another reason this documentary is done very well. At one point, one of the spokespersons for ICE is, is questioned about whether or not this policy of separating um, children from their parents at the border, or, or if they're caught with children at the border, whether it's an intentional policy that's designed to make children suffer and families suffer in order to lead to a policy of deterrence. In other words, voluntary compliance with immigration laws. And to her credit, uh, the spokesperson says, that's an, even, it's, it's even insulting to ask me that question. That's, of course, not what we're doing. They go down, down the line, and they talk to the actual police officers that are in charge of these programs on the local level. They're still federal agents, but of course they're working. They've got boots on the ground. And they flat out say, <laughs> about five minutes earlier or 10 minutes earlier in the program, they say that this is a policy that is designed to cause deterrence. And it's a direct contradiction what's happening in Washington, D.C., the state of the country's capital, and what's happening away from the country's capital, uh, you know, closer to the ground. And so the reason you don't have complex is when you, uh, context is when you have this level of complexity and a large landmass with multiple agencies involved across different levels of government. First of all, you can see why centralization works better. And this has been one of the themes of the last hundred years with China, with Singapore, with the Catholic Church, is that you don't necessarily have similar problems in terms of expanding your influence and employment if you're able to create a, or, or show a consistent front, especially if you're able to hide that money uh, <laughs> or using the law illegally because they're the ones helping pass the laws. Um, and you've got people all over the globe, all over the globe that are sort of benefiting from this international, um, international unit that, it, that answers back to a central organization. And so everyone's on the same page and, and because they're on the same page, they have an advantage over a more dispersed, fragmented population of minorities, regardless of, of merit, regardless of the merit, merits of each competing group. And this is not what the system of government was ever designed to do. It was designed, in fact, to bring all the groups, fragmented groups, into a public forum, hash out these issues in a public forum, and then create a solution together in a collaborative fashion. But over time, you can see that you know, we haven't had comprehensive immigration reform in many, many decades. And so what's the reason for that, and the reason why this, this issue has become so pitched, is in part because it's become much more complex over time to understand. And part of that is because of this dynamic where you don't change the underlying infrastructure. In some cases, you can't change it. And even if you did change it, you're in a position, you're in a position where it doesn't necessarily do you much good because whoever's making the laws at the national level is not going to have a branch at the local level. So you will have miscommunications because of that distance over that long, large landmass. So when you have this dynamic, the only way you can fix anything is by is incrementally. And that results in appealing to emotion because not logic. And as, as if you study law, you, you keep thinking to yourself, you know, if I just draft this beautiful piece of legislation, it'll fix everything. Nobody will have 
you know, reason to complain. And as long as I don't have somebody who's completely corrupt, you're going to have a situation where things will improve over time. And that's what people talk about in history. They talk about incremental change, that the arc of justice is, is long, but eventually we get there. Uh, what that is, what that Martin Luther King quote is, which I've just botched, is this idea of incremental change. And the reason that we talk in that language is because empires expand power based on centralization. And over time, that centralization gives way over a large landmass, over a large population, makes it harder and harder to create comprehensive reform. So the result of all that is that politicians and everyone else connected to the government, because so much of the economy, wherever you go, is connected to government spending and loans and banks and so on, and especially natural resources. And so when you look at these issues comprehensively, over time you, you have what's called factions or vested interests, and they fight to keep their local programs. And that's one of the reasons, you know, and, and that's actually the way it was designed. You don't want the federal government coming in and supplanting local institutions because you assume that the local people know their communities better than the national government that's far away in a different place. And so you have uneven enforcement. I'm taking, taking a long time to sort of explain this lack of context, but let's get to it now. A lack of context results because you cannot, over time, displace local interests, especially when those local interests are in a position where they're responsible for a lot of jobs. And if you try to displace that, you've got another massive problem on your hands, namely unemployment, especially in a country where almost everyone is in debt, especially in a country where you have inequality based on wealth and a lot of other issues, especially in a country that has had legal segregation over time, which has resulted in, in a house like this being worth you know, a million dollars, even though the exact same house in Texas would be worth not even half that. Same country, different policies on taxation, lots of different policies overall based on supply and demand and vastly different results. So the lack of context causes people to appeal to emotions in order to pass an exception to the rule, which over time becomes unwieldy and the lawyers end up becoming out of touch because they don't know what's happening all over the country because the enforcement mechanisms become more and more inconsistent. And over time, the only way to change anything is for your own group based on an appeal to emotions. The reason for that being, in this case, he was, this person was saying that I fought overseas. He didn't really fight overseas. He was fueling a lot of civilian jobs within the military. Um, and so, you know, got to, those jets and those ships have to be fueled. Somebody's got to cook and so on. So you've got a situation where he was saying, I fought for freedom. I shed blood for this country didn't actually say if he saw any combat, but you can see that this is all designed to appeal to emotion and factions, right? You've got this faction that is trying to separate itself from the brunt of the law. And so the only way you can really, what happens really is that you say, I'm better than this other group. I served my country or I, I promoted this, this, and this. In reality, right after Vietnam in this country, if you have been in a military fighting, it has not been for freedom at all. Um, in Vietnam, of course, that was part of the Catholic Church's uh, desire to expand against communism. Communism, another central, or a centralized structure that butted heads with another centralized structure, the Catholic Church, to the point where in, you know, the United States was funding an archbishop, the brother of Diem, D-I-E-M, who was running things in South Vietnam and who was discriminating against Buddhists using U.S. dollars. Something that JFK eventually put an end to. Um, but not before a monk put himself, you know, put himself on fire, leading to that iconic photo that most of us have seen um, in his Buddhist dress. Now, when you look at this, you start to see that this dynamic plays out everywhere. Um, it's not just, it's, but it's all, it all comes down to the same thing. There's no fundamental reform. There's not even a desire to do it. And so it would just affect too many things. Now you've got this long distance and long time period of all these different vested interests that are now connected by debt.
and the debt has to be paid in order, in order to continue investment. Because if you start defaulting, especially in a country that has that owes so much money all over, all over the world, especially in a country where the same piece of property has vastly different values simply based on location, you end up having so much dislocation that the people in power will be replaced. We don't know whether or not the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know or vice versa. So corruption is something that every country, especially larger ones, deal with over time. And what's problematic in the US, within, especially within democratic systems, is the way that people have responded, especially politicians, because now what ends up happening is they just sort of move from distraction to distraction rather than saying, well, you know, if, if you fought in a war after Vietnam or you were part of, a, of the US military after Vietnam, you're actually part of this really massive international um, system, ecosystem, that protects the US dollar and makes it into the international form of currency based on trading oil in, in the US dollars. And part of that is the ability to control the supply of oil directly or indirectly. Um, and part of that, of course, leads to situations where you're, either you or your allies start to, um, again, control supplies of oil or natural gas over time, thereby being able to, thereby preserving that infrastructure for your banking system and therefore your currency. And Iraq, of course, has it's, it's some oil, but really the natural gas is, is phenomenal in that area. And that's one of the reasons that if you fought in that war, multiple wars, the idea was to prevent that natural, those natural gas fields from going into someone else, whether it was Russia or some other competitor, who was probably aligning him itself with another competitor in order to create a similar system. That's also another reason why when you defeat your enemy, in many cases, you defeat that enemy by becoming them and by understanding them and by getting to that piece of property or real estate or natural resource or whatever it is that lubricates your economy, you get there first and you, and you protect it and you make it difficult to dislocate um, your influence and your currency. And so, you see this all over. You say, you know, people, rather than coming up with a comprehensive solution, they don't see themselves as equal to other people within this ecosystem, whether cultural or uh, otherwise. And so, so much of the media that you see no longer has an interest in creating this context because the idea is to distract you from the fact that you're not able to create a comprehensive solution because doing so would be extremely disruptive to the centralized organizations involved that are at this point, whether legitimate um, banks, international banking systems, multinational corporations, or illegitimate, such as mafia. Um, rather than deal with that massive, massive dislocation, which would reduce power and, dis and probably lead to war, the idea is to not to see people as equals, but to start changing smaller parts within the system, the overall system. And so this has happened over in so many different ways. Uh, women, for example, have benefited uh, quite a bit from affirmative action. Uh, and these things were, in contrast, these things were necessary because they dealt with legal restrictions. So for example, when a law was passed favoring, or, or not favoring, but outlawing discrimination on the basis of color or race, well, within the US that was designed especially uh, to co compensate people or, or essentially to penalize certain areas in the, in the United States, especially the South, for continuing discrimination that was enacted by laws or segregation. And of course, the South, quite some time ago, decided to create a funding mechanism that bypassed the government. Uh, they weren't able to do it legally, so they, did it, they tried to do it financially which led to more and more segregation, which then created another Band-Aid, which was, in some cases, busing. Um, you, know, you had white flight. That dealt, that led to other issues with real estate home sales, uh, and so on and so forth. And so, you can see that there's a difference between trying to right a wrong, using the law to correct a legal issue that was wrong, such as discrimination, that was enshrined in a law like Jim Crow and using the law 
to create an exception to the general rule in a way that places some people above others based on their profession, uh, based on their ethnicity, or based on some sort of personal characteristic that is not connected to what's called de jure or legal discrimination or legal handicaps. And so disabilities, for example, are sometimes given, quote unquote, some sort of, let me give you an example. So with the, there is legislation that, for example, funds or allows the government to award contracts based on uh, hiring a certain number of people, whether veterans or people who are disabled. So you can see right away that there's a structural barrier to people who are disabled in finding work. If they don't find work, they go on welfare, the government ends up paying them anyway. Um, it's just in a different way. And it's also not good to have people that are divorced from mainstream society. So what you're doing is you have this biological um, deterrent, or not a deterrent, you have this biological impediment to this group finding work. And so you end up trying to fix that by prov providing legal or financial mechanisms to fix a problem that is not able to be solved on its own without assistance. Now, with the veteran situation, that's more difficult to justify because the government has already trained people to using taxpayer money uh, and is now trying to create that infrastructure. Um, and you can see right away that you know, we're already, in the U.S., we're already, already spending quite a bit of money on the military, so, which involves training people, um, which then involves a lot of other benefits like the GI Bill and so on. And so on top of that, in order to maintain this structure, we're funding, an, funding that, that mechanism, that infrastructure even more in order to justify its existence, but not for any reason that is historical or that is necessary. Um, and so you can see right away that one, one of these, path A versus path B, one of them encourages corruption because all it's trying to do is maintain that infrastructure. Whereas the other one is trying to fix a problem that cannot be fixed by itself using either the free market or some other mechanism that occurs naturally. And so when you, over time, you, the real problem has been, once again, the enforcement because what is a disability? Who is disabled? And you can see right off the bat that if you make the laws too generous or you make the funding too generous, people suddenly want to be part of this class of people that were historically disfavored. And this is where, this is one reason why Donald Trump won is he's called this out on one of his competitors, Elizabeth Warren, who was blonde hair, blue eyes, very white, very Anglo looking, who claimed that she was part Native American in order to... <laughs> Again, bring us off into that sort of category of a protected class. Um, even myself, when I when I applied, I think to UCLA, I got in, and they kept, and they wanted to ask me at some in public school, public college, and uh, and they wanted to ask me something about my my background. And I'm I'm, I'm an immigrant. I'm also a U.S. citizen at this point. Um, but <laughs> what what you see is this desire to attach funding to correct, into programs to correct historical problems and then highlight yourself as being successful and practical because you're doing something that's helpful, which is something that's inherent in most of us when we see a problem that's obvious. In my case, I refused to follow the form that was um, asking me about some sort of protected class. In other words, it was now that, now that I, I've studied law, I know what it was doing. It was asking me all these questions in order to get legal compliance for specific programs that would then assist me in integrating into the whatever programs I wanted to get funding for. And that was what was going on and I, and I looked at it and it just didn't seem right, so I didn't do it. Um, I didn't, I refused to send that back. You know what, I was actually rejected for UCLA, I think. No, no, no I, I can't remember at this point because it's, all, it's really funny, all I remember was I went to Davis, lovely school. Uh, they didn't send me any any of these follow-up forms. They just accepted me, and and that was it. Um, also a public school for undergraduates. And so you see right away that if you have too many of these splintered groups getting government funding over time, you end up in a position where, first of all, it's difficult to keep track of all these things. Second of all, it's difficult to show results. And not, not necessarily because the program doesn't work, but because too many people then who are outside of the ambit of this funding, they might not, not otherwise have access to, are now encouraged to bend things, even powerful people, like this is a politician who represents Massachusetts, 
who's extremely powerful, um, rich, millionaire, you end up with people like that trying to latch on, latch themselves onto these so-called helpful programs. And then you have all these splinter groups. Libertarians look at that and say, this is ridiculous. We need, we need less government. And in fact, the idea is that every, in every society, uh, voters have believed, regardless of the time period, that there's been too much government. That tells you right off the bat why. This, this, this discussion here, this lecture should tell you why. It's because the government, in many cases, rather than trying to ameliorate problems, is now stuck once it has a program that is not available to everyone. Because you end up having to make judgment calls. And remember, laws without morals are useless, but the morals have to be in everyone. And so that then takes us into the immigration issue, which can, can be resolved intellectually in a couple of sentences. People don't mind immigration when the economy is doing well. They hate immigration when the economy is not doing well. Whether regardless of whether it's legal or illegal. It's an economic issue, not an, not an intellectual issue. This has been true in every country in every time period. And regardless of that dynamic, people still end up thinking it's more complex than what it is. And <laughs> it's shocking because it's extremely shocking because of the of the idea again that how simple this is, how straightforward the actual dynamic of the immigration political debate is. And in this discussion, you can see how why it gets there. People are then caught in this ambit. Um, of government trying to do good things. There's a backlash because too many people are now involved in it, it under, the, under, an, under an emotional basis that separates themselves from other people, whether justifiably or unjustifiably. And the programs work. Because they work, they get more funding, perhaps. In other words, you can't, you can't win. If it works, you get more funding. You then make it more mainstream. You then expand in order to justify that funding. <laughs> If it fails, um, you probably still have some, some governmental infrastructure there, some employees there that have to get paid who are hired um, or, who, or who have to be shuffled, shuffled into other agencies over time, even though they're not necessarily qualified for that. So the lack of context is a natural result of success, especially in an empire that has international implications, which is most empires. Because most empires become empires by extending their influence economically and then using their economic currency and control of, of necessary resources in order to project this idea that they are the first empire in the history of the world to be just and magnanimous. Hmm. And you know what's funny is in China's case, it may have one of the best arguments for that because in the last 70 years, it has not occupied anyone on foreign soil. It itself was occupied by the British in Hong Kong. So <laughs> it's, it's going to be a very interesting time. I'm really sad that I won't get to see it 200 years from now because China will have the same problems that we're talking about now. It may be in a different context, but it will have the exact same problems, but it'll be addressing these problems through a centralized situation. And so we don't know if it's going to work um, or we don't know how it's going to work. But we know that why in Western countries, especially the United States, why there's so much political division. And part of it is because you don't have people that have an interest in creating context. You have people that have an interest in maintaining the infrastructure, the existing status quo, and then adding band-aids to it. And in order to do that, they're appealing to people's, they're appealing to people's emotions. Now, one of the most poignant scenes in this documentary was a situation where in uh, where there's a town hall meeting and the sheriff is explaining why they will they will be cooperating with the federal government and in response a sociologist comes in and says that actually the, of the you know, you've arrested 50 people on, under this program that's designed to reduce illegal immigration but of those 50 people our research says that 90 percent were arrested for misdemeanors in other words, probably something that's nonviolent. But <laughs> you can see right off the bat that well, what's, what's the misdemeanor? It can be anything from intimidation in a public place to you know, a certain, exceeding a certain speed limit. Uh, and all of that goes back to what the law is. 
And you can see right off the bat that you have all this research. And then the police officer says at one point, you can get research to mean anything. Research is research. So that goes back to that saying that we had a while ago, which is laws without morals are useless, which is another way of saying that you can have all, all the laws and enforcement you want, but it's not gonna work unless you have credibility. And the only way you're going to have credibility is not only to have consistency within the enforcement of laws, but to make decisions based on some moral foundation that justifies the discrepancies in the results. So if you have a program that favors disabilities, you say, well, you know, um, you don't want, let me give you an example. I'm eligible for a discount because I'm hearing impaired on public transportation. I can drive a car. You don't need to hear to drive a car very, I mean, it helps obviously, but you know, driving is mostly visual. It, you can probably, you know, it, it's, you can obviously say that if you're in a wheelchair and you're not able to drive at all, that would be the target group for a discount, a substantial discount, about 50% off of the trains, uh, train system, um, and some other, on the other hand, there's not much public transportation here. So it's not as if this is worth a substantial amount of money to anybody. But because I'm hearing impaired, I'm eligible for that program and I have applied for it. And I, and I will get a card that gives me a discount, despite the fact that I'm a pretty, I'm a, I'm a relatively good driver. So should I, is it moral for me to get that card? And the answer is, well, you can justify it anyway, right? You can say that, well, it is because I've got to spend all this other money on, on you know, medical equipment that the, the government doesn't pay for, which is thousands of dollars on hearing aids, especially over my life, which puts me at a disadvantage compared to the general population that does not uh, have to suffer those expenses in order to live in the mainstream. And so this is an example where if the government is not going to subsidize the medical devices for whatever reason. Uh, um, you know, the government doesn't really, really subsidize de dental work either, which doesn't make any sense to me either, because you can't really, you know, if you have a toothache or you need a root canal, you're not going to be a member of society very well, a uh, working, productive person anyway. So I can justify it by that argument, which is financial, but is it moral? Um, it's hard to say. Right? It really depends on, on how you look at it, and it depends on the big picture. Am I using other programs, uh, other welfare programs? Am I, what's, the, what's the budget? Am I incurring an expense that is, in, in, that is inordinate uh, on the government's ability to pay? Am I taking a slot away from someone else? And when you look at it in context, uh, all those answers are in favor of me applying for the program and having the card, especially because <laughs> you, know, you can't always here if some conductor is talking to you so you just got to flash the card and, and in many cases you know hearing aids don't do well with sweat so you got to take them off all the time you can't hear anything that's going on around you unless you're looking directly at somebody at someone um and so you if you just flash the card people will be like okay well this guy's got an exception but it's for a reasonable cause i don't want to get into it but you know this is not somebody i can just move on i can do my job and move on it helps both people the employee and the consumer in that case and again, you're not taking a slot away from, from anybody else. You're not incurring hundreds of dollars you know, in, in lost revenue or in credits. So all that, if you put it all together now, all that requires some intellect. It requires the ability of the law, well, not the law, but morality to see the whole person. And that's very difficult, especially if you have a government that wants you to make those numbers. And what you see over time is you don't want the system to become complex. If you're trying to and you're going to have these problems in the future. You don't want it to be so complex that you need a genius or some lawyer to evaluate these programs. You're not going to get them. <laughs> You're not going to get those people. Most good people or intellectuals that have practical experience do not want to be politicians for the simple reason they understand that it's supposed to be a boring job. It's not supposed to be something that's glamorous. It's supposed to kind of feel sorry for whoever has to deal with all these difficult moral, you know, sort of weighing uh, scales when it comes to creating these programs and making these decisions. Uh, I, at one point, I volunteered to read college, college admission essays. I had to stop after one day. It was too difficult for me. It wasn't the kind of decision I wanted to make, um, even on that level, because you're dealing with somebody's life. And so you can see how <laughs> you can see how you why why these programs eventually expand. Because if I had to do that for a week, if I could not quit, I would eventually become overly generous.
uh, in improving these essays. I would give everybody, you know, a certain mark. Because I was told, I think I was told, if I remember correctly, well, you know, a, a seven, anything above a seven means, well, it's helpful, and anything below a seven means that, you know, you just, it's probably not helpful. Even though that's only one slot, one factor in the admissions e evaluation, it became increasingly harder over six, seven hours of reading essays to start giving people anything under a seven, because you were making that, you know, people are 18 years old, sorry, 21, uh, 20 years old, it's really hard to make those judgments. And so you end up, if you're a good, if you're a normal person, not necessarily a good one, if you're a normal person, you end up trying to err on the side of generosity or liberalism. And when, so all these programs go back to what we said earlier, the programs get too big, you then have a backlash because too many other people are coming in that don't necessarily meet the equation or the factors that were originally contemplated. There's a backlash, there's a strong man that's elected. You can call him a fascist or whatever, but whatever it is, that person is supposed to fix this liberalism, this openness that is excessive, that leads to people like Elizabeth Warren claiming that she's a minority, even though she's clearly not in any way, shape or form. Um, and that's just one example. And so what's the solution? If you have too much of a central government, you don't get, <laughs> you leave yourself open to a failure to develop potential, as well as just a failure in terms of gathering sufficient information at the ground level in order to make wise decisions. There's an idea, a hypothesis, that with surveillance technology, it allows better data gathering, especially now that most people have cell phones that have a lot of data on them. There's this idea that centralized systems will prosper much more so than theoretically more diverse systems that allow for more local control. That is something that would be much, very much in favor of, of centralized organizations, especially within single countries like Singapore and China, where elections become not necessarily a way to change the government, but a way to let the, the existing government know, um, the existing dominant party know, that something's wrong over here, in this location, we need to send more people down there to figure out what's going on. Uh, and then the hope, of course, is where's the check, what were the checks and balances if the government decides to become too heavy-handed in, quote, fix, quote, unquote, fixing the problem. Because you can fix any problem by putting people in jail. Another reason uh, the United States, some, some, another problem the United States has, has had is that it's relied on that, especially because after 9-11, uh, where you have that growth, all those jobs, then you have to show numbers. And then those moral calculations on something as simple as a 50% discount on a $7 train ride become more and more difficult when multiplied by hundreds of millions of people and three different levels of government and many, many more complex factors. So at least we know if you're trying to come out of this morass or if you're an up and coming country and you're trying to avoid this morass, at least you know that you, once you have a law that over time there's a tendency for the academics, the, the lawyers to become divorced from the consequences of those laws on the ground floor. Because every law has to have enforcement and every law has a measure of discretion that necessarily results in unequal treatment. And the question becomes at that point is whether or not you can justify that unequal treatment on a moral ground. And if you cannot, whether or not once you're notified of that, fix it. And the other issue is, which by the way requires an independent journalism situation, which one of the other problems with the US and a lot of other countries. Um, the, so that's one of the factors that leads to a decline over time within a democratic system. The other factor is not just the laws and the lawyers eventually divorcing themselves from what is actually the enforcement and the consequences of those enforcement actions relating to the laws they pass. The other problem is that because the, the status quo has a lot of money to stay in power, nothing fundamental gets changed because it's just easier for everyone, governments and, and individuals and corporations to build more complexity or more exceptions onto the existing infrastructure, whether legal or physical, rather than trying to come up with a better way of doing things. And we see some of that, right? We see, you know, why the technology sector is taking off. I mean, it's, it's, it's not subject to whatever happened before it. In many cases, it's dominant in a, in a centralized way. 
Um, it's divorced from the physical infrastructure, so it doesn't have to worry about incremental change for the most part. And so you can see why the rise of technology is eventually going to supplant almost all economic theories that have come up, that have been invented uh, so far. Because you have, once again, this tendency for the existing infrastructure to use emotion in order to show that it's doing something valuable, even though the value that it's adding to the situation, even if true, involves dividing the country rather than fixing a historical legal wrong. But because it's able to, to appeal to emotion, it's able to get whatever it wants done, which over time leads to what some people have called compassion fatigue as the society becomes more and more balkanized based on not, not necessarily race or religion, but simply based on the government trying to show its own utility and compassion by creating exceptions to whatever rule is not necessarily uh, being adequately inclusive over time, especially when you add immigration to the mix, which then adds another layer of complexity. Do you print political documents in multiple languages? What about captions? If you, how do you do all these things without upsetting the status quo to make it look like you're being inclusive, but not at the expense of the existing population and, or the people who are, who probably deem themselves the natural citizens um, of that particular government or that country. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is when the economy is doing well, no one cares. When everyone has a job, when the values of housing are going up, no one cares. People only care about these things when the economy is not doing well. And they look for people to blame because they, they once again, nobody wants to fix the underlying infrastructure that led to all these fragmented issues. And so once you realize that, maybe that's a way to avoid compassion fatigue, is to just focus on the economy and everyone's role in the economy, uh, everyone's role in the economy, uh, you know, as necessary rather than uh, disparate or excessive uh, in some way.